Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third webinar of this year's Navigate webinar series from the Northeast Clean Energy Council and Navigate, NEP's innovation program. My name is Katarina Madeira, and I run Navigate. For those attending for the first time, this series is part of NETEC's and Navigate mission to support early stage clean tech startups and ecosystem stakeholders, such as incubators and accelerators, by providing them learning opportunities about investment and strategic partnerships like this webinar series, as well as connections to investors, corporates, and customers. So if you too want to be part of it, please do reach out. These webinars, and in fact, Navigate, have the invaluable support from NYSERDA, MassTC, Commerce Array and Rhode Island Foundation, BNP Paribas, the Government Southern Incubator, Clean Energy Ventures, the Roy AN Foundation, the Canadian Consulate, and Mint 11. And we're working to keep growing this list. <laughs> we work very closely with all of them to design and provide tailored programs and highly vetted connections to the clean tech community. Our ultimate goal at NECC is to provide innovation and accelerate the clean energy sector. And it is an honor to have such hands on partners. Thank you so much to all. Um, I'm here today with a fantastic panel of entrepreneurs, corporate strategics, and investors. We'll hear from Anna Jarman from Walmart Technology, Eli Greenberg from Greenbacker Labs, Colleague Gowden from Startup Via, and Daniel Ulla from GE Ventures, that will play a double role today as a moderator and as a panelist. Some of the topics we'll cover are the different formats of collaboration between investment firms and large corporates can take, and how early stage startups can leverage from it, and how they can get ready for that as well. Um, but we want to hear from our audience too. We have a couple of Q&A moments in the agenda during which we'd love to address your questions that you can send us through the Q&A feature you see on your GoToWebinar. Before passing the mic to Daniel, I'd like, I'd like to remind you about a few housekeeping uh, topics, so please uh, stay on mute to avoid uh, any sound problem. Um, we'll, uh, after wrapping up the conversation, you'll receive a very short survey about the session because your feedback is very important to us and our funders. And please tweet it us using the hashtag NECC webinar. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over the webinar to Daniel Ulla, Managing Director at GE Ventures. Daniel, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Katerina. Daniel Huller here with GE Ventures. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. I'm actually sitting in NECC's global headquarters in Boston, <laughs> uh, just a few short blocks from, uh, from my office with GE uh, at, at GE's headquarters in Boston. Uh, the topic today, I think, is really important. Uh, for us to make a difference in clean energy, uh, we, need, uh, we need both entrepreneurial talent and uh, the ability to scale that for, for high impact and, and to really make a difference at, at the level of the energy system that, that we all operate at. And I think corporations play an important role. Uh, I think they can play a more important role. And maybe we'll get to some of the, the things that are, that are not done or can be done better in the discussion today. Um, I'm really pleased to see that we've got such a diverse group of uh, viewpoints uh, around the table. Um, probably GE is the, uh, is the legacy company represented in this portfolio as a, as a large technology OEM of, of more than 100 years old. But we're going to hear from Anna, uh, who is at the bleeding edge of technology for Walmart. Um, and that may not be something that is too familiar to many of you, but I'd love to hear what, what Walmart is thinking about and how they're addressing innovation. Uh, we're going to hear from Greenbacker Labs, um, and really with, with one foot in the startup world and one foot in the, uh, in the project finance and, uh, and, and the asset world. And we're going to hear from an entrepreneur, from Colin Gowden, uh, who started his company uh, literally uh, in a garage in Somerville, a garage that I'm pleased to say I used as a garage, <laughs> my car serviced there before it turned into a startup hub for, for beer. And so we'll get it from the horse's mouth, what it's worked like to be an entrepreneur working with a corporate. And without too much foreshadowing, one of the corporates that beer is working with is GE. So I better be on, on my best behavior. 
Uh, so really pleased that we're tackling this subject, really pleased we've got these great viewpoints. And I'd love to hear as much candor as possible from the participants and as much uh, perceptive and, and, and in-depth questions from, from the audience. So don't hold back. I think we're going to start off with uh, some introductions to, to flush out the uh, flesh out the the roles of the various groups and the people that we have on the on the webinar. And we're going to start with Anna. So Anna, over to you to tell us about Walmart and uh, Store Eight and and what you're up to. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so. Walmart is it's a super interesting company. It's known uh, as one of the world's largest, but um, people often don't know much more than that. Um, so just going through real quick, um, it's headquartered in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, its founder is Sam Walton, and there's still a lot of stuff that gets talked about um, with Sam and his um, the characteristics that he always wanted for the company. It's been around since 1962, and today we have 2.3 million employees worldwide. Um, we've got 11,000 stores roughly, and our yearly revenue is about 514 billion. And so I bring up this size because that, um, because of this size, we actually have multiple places within Walmart where innovation happens, and we also have a lot of um, a lot of different branches. So of our different divisions, we have Walmart US, Walmart International, Sam's Club. Um, some people are probably familiar with Sam's Club. It's a bit like a Costco, but better, of course. Um, <laughs> so <it's terrible. laughs> yeah, right. Other stores are available. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and we have our, our global e-commerce, which is uh, Walmart.com, and that's um, one of the things that um, we're working on growing um, in a lot of different ways. People know it as sort of the the Amazon competitor. Um, and our subsidiaries, and this is where this may be of interest to a lot of people because this is sort of our acquisition state. Um, we have acquired Voodoo, Moose Jaw, Net.com, and some of these I didn't even list, Art.com, um, Hay Needle, Shoes, uh, see, and you'll see a lot of these are a .com, um, ModCloth, Bonobos, Flipkart, and Flipkart's um, a very large e-commerce site in India. Um, and so Walmart is very quickly trying to expand what it does and how it does it. And one of the things that it looks to to figure out how to do that is, is startups um, and smaller companies. Um, and actually, our head of e-commerce is a former entrepreneur, a guy named Mark Laurie. And he he started he founder, founded diapers.com, and then we bought jet.com from him for $3.3 billion. Um, and today, he runs our e-commerce arm. So that's, um, that's been a lot of fun for him, I'm sure. So um, if you go to the... Um, to the next one, to um, store number eight. So store number eight is it's sort of one of our more um, highly visible groups, and it's our incubation arm. Um, and what they do is they, they take companies who have a bit of a longer time horizon. So companies, uh, so they're, they're an innovation arm, and they focus on companies who are five to seven years out in terms of their ability to deploy or um, create um, value for Walmart but that have something really special, really important, like a game changer, basically, um, a game changing technology. But what they really look for, what Store Number 8 really looks for, is somebody who are passionate about the, the combined strategy between Walmart and, and a platform. Um, and they just, they wanna make sure that uh, whoever it is can, can fit within the Walmart culture. Um, so, they operate as standalone startups. They basically, they let them fly and do their own thing. And then they uh, they sort of co-develop them, try to make sure that eventually they'll be a good fit. And it's sort of like a, it's a long-term, let's just say, potential uh, acquisition vehicle. So um, I'm not actually a part of store number eight. I'm part of the next one, which is the following, which is Walmart technology. Um, so I'm located down in Austin, Texas. And what we do is actually develop technologies in-house, um, software-based, um, AR, VR, machine learning, computer vision. Um, and it's, for us, it's a build by a collaborate model. Um, what we look at is whether technologies that Walmart needs to use, um, if it's something we can build in-house, if it's something we should buy, or if it's something that we need somebody that's more innovative externally, if we need somebody like them to do it. So we're constantly scouting. We're like an emerging tech scout. Um, we're constantly looking, trying to find people who are doing awesome things. 
and then we want to find them, run POCs, but we need people who are doing these things in the next year or two. So store number eight, five to seven years out, us more immediate. Um, but we also, because Walmart's a big fan of an acquisition, um, we we tend to look at these companies and think, okay, what's the best relationship? Um, I should also note that Walmart does not have a VC arm. This is something that we've been exploring, but what we tend to do is non-equity investments or just become a customer, really good customer, I should say. Um, so that's that's us. And just an example of some of the stuff that we've done, um, Team 8, uh, is we, we basically did a syndicate investment. This is a little different than the typical model, but this is out in Israel. Um, they did an international um, investment, and these guys, they're like an incubator. Um, they they spin out companies, so us and a bunch of others um, spend these guys $85 million, and we just sit quietly and wait while they spin out um, cybersecurity startups. And then when they do, we pounce on them. So, so that's Walmart's um, current. It's a it's a real grab bag of interactions, but um, but right now because of our size, um, you can pretty much find any arm within Walmart willing to do just about um, just about anything with a bunch of startups. So, so there you go. Fan fantastic, uh, real whirlwind tour there. Thank you very much. And we're going to come back to some of the things that you uh, <laughs> you raised there uh, later in the later in the webinar. So. I think next up uh, we have Eli, uh, mm -hmm. Eli Greenberg from Greenback Labs, and the floor is yours. Tell us about what you're up to. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone, for for joining the call. Pleasure to to be here. Um, so if we go to the, the next slide, I'll give you a little background on Greenbacker and Gre Greenbacker Labs. So uh, Greenbacker Labs started uh, as part of Greenbacker Capital, uh, which is about uh, an eight-year-old company. Uh, we're an asset management platform where we've raised uh, about $500 million uh, and invested that into solar uh, in wind assets all over North America. Uh, we own and operate those assets, and we uh, provide a dividend to our uh, to our investors. Uh, and so, essentially, we've got a um, we've got a, a platform of assets all over uh, the United States focused on. Uh, solar and wind, and you know, our, as part of that, our specialty is really project finance. Um, but in seeking new opportunities in this sustainable infrastructure space, uh, we started a group called Greenbacker Labs, which is the the group that I run. Um, and we do two things: we do uh, corporate investment, um, so what you can think of as venture capital that we put our money in in, in various different forms. Um, so we try to work with companies uh, as they need uh, in, in the best way possible for them. Uh, and then we also uh, Try to provide those companies project finance. Um, so what we've recognized is that uh, obviously companies need working capital, but what companies in the sustainable infrastructure space also need is some type of project finance because very often they have a product that costs ten thousand dollars to let's say a million dollars, um, and you know it's it's too new for a bank. Uh, the owner or the customer doesn't want to put it on their their balance sheet, so they need a project finance option. And to use uh, equity is just too expensive. Um, and so we can come in with a lower cost of, of capital through project finance, and that really helps uh, companies grow and, and drive up the value. Uh, and to that end, we, we generally look at four areas. So efficiency, uh, whether that's energy efficiency, water efficiency, um, anything to make buildings and cities more efficient. Uh, we spend a lot of time on a water uh, modular wastewater treatment, uh, water treatment, um, different types of, of technologies there. Uh, we spend a lot of time also looking at renew various types of, of renewable energy companies. So they could be developers, solar and wind, uh, microgrid developers, uh, could be folks uh, in the uh, energy storage space. Um, and then the last section we look at is green processes, which is kind of a, a catch-all for you know, small-scale carbon capture, e-waste recycling, circular economy. Um, and, and this is where we, you know, we, we, we think we can – uh, provide a lot of value to these companies, uh, partly based on our project finance experience, but also based on a lot of the the in-house uh, experience that we have. And and the other part of what this helps us do also is is you know research and develop technologies that help the, the larger greenbacker infrastructure. Um, because as I said at the outset, we've got all of these solar and wind assets uh, all over the country that we own and operate. And to the extent that we can find uh, companies who provide a synergistic effect to, to the assets we already have that helps increase the value of, of our portfolio as well and, and also helps the uh, the companies that we're, we're investing in. So it's kind of a it's kind of a win-win uh, for everyone. Um, so you can go on to the, the next slide. 
So when does when does Labs invest? So we, uh, you know, so thinking about us sort of from a venture perspective for a moment, we uh, look for companies that are sort of you know, post seed Series A, where there's a technology that's been proven out um, either through rigorous pilot testing or through third party val- uh, verification. Um, they've got some type of, of you know, l- large enough base uh, to install it. There's a there's a large market out there for. Uh, whatever the particular product is, uh, and they're and they're ready to scale. So they, they they've got a team, uh, and so we'll come in and you know we can lead a, a Series A round. We can participate. Uh, we can do convertible notes. We can do uh, preferential preferred loan. Um, you know, there's various different constructions that we can do to help companies grow. And you know, we have a lot of structured finance experience, and so that that allows us to be very flexible and meet the needs of of companies. Um, you know, so so our our paradigm isn't necessarily uh, set in stone. And then on top of this, um, you know, what we like to do is not always a requirement, but you know, we like companies that provide a project finance opportunity. And so to that extent, we can structure some type of project finance facility where, uh, you know, it could be a million dollar facility, a five million dollar facility, something like that, where uh, companies can then draw upon that money uh, and use those funds for projects. So they have a collection of Five hundred thousand dollar projects, for example, uh, they can draw on those funds to finance those projects, and then uh, there's a payment there's a payment uh, scheme that's set with those to to obviously pay back into the facility, and then we can recycle capital, and that helps companies grow and get their get their products out to market uh, faster. So next next slide. So just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, connecting the dots between investors and, and strategics, and so. You know what is what is strategic mean? I think there's, you know, just to sort of clarify, there's strategic investors and strategic partners. Um, and so strategic investors are th- those investors who who are looking to invest to improve their own their own business. Um, so for example, it's easier to invest in a company sometimes than it is to to start a whole new product line. Uh, so find find a, a startup that's doing something that that you need, um, you know, in efficiency and water, whatever the the particular sector is. Uh, and then obviously help that company grow with the potential that you're going to acquire them or develop some type of, of commercial partnership with them with them l- later on. Uh, so that's that's one angle from the strategic. And then the other the other strategic angle um, I think is important to, to consider is you know, just it's a key business relationship. So it's a, you know having that relationship with with Greenbacker, with Walmart, uh, with whoever the customer is. Um, you know, they become a customer. They become a vendor potentially. Um, and, and it's a way that you can you can obviously increase the value of your own company because you've got you've got those key those key partnerships and I think the the value of strategics in whichever route you go um, you know it helps validate the product market fit for the company and it helps helps provide uh, a sale a sales channel and you know certainly from an investor perspective when we see uh, companies that have various types of strategic partnerships it definitely does increase the value of those companies because it, it demonstrates that other people find the particular product uh, valuable. Uh, it demonstrates the market for it, and and I think over, overall, you know, it definitely uh, increases the the positioning of the of the company. Um, and so I've, I've got one more slide uh, at the end, and I think this might be uh, a, a little premature, but it's a recent case study that um, I just want to touch on. It's a, a recent investment. I don't know that I'm at liberty to release the name, but. Essentially, we we just uh, we just invested in a, an energy efficiency company here in, in New York City uh, that helps make multifamily buildings more energy efficient. And it, you know, this is this is sort of a a, a two pronged uh, strategic investment co investment. On the one hand, you know, we co invested alongside a, a large real estate venture firm um, that also manages a lot of property. And so, you know, that's something that increases the value of the of the company in question because it gives them a large market for for what they're doing and, and provides validation. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, it's also an opportunity where, you know, we can provide a project finance uh, option to this this company we invested in, um, and that helps them grow faster and, and grow their market as well. So, um, you know, happy to answer more questions uh, later on about that um, or about Greenbacker, but that's that's a Greenbacker Labs in a, in a nutshell. Fantastic. So you've got lots of different, uh, lots of different ways to engage there. So we'll, we'll come back to those. So I think I'm going to give you a, a quick uh, a quick spin around GE Business Innovations. Uh, many folks may know uh, GE's uh, involvement in the venture capital and innovation space as one of the 
one of the long-standing uh, investors uh, and corporate VC groups, if you go to the next slide. Um, wanted just to make the point that it is more, more than just uh, venture capital investing. Uh, the Business Innovations Group engages in a number of different activities, including uh, in and out licensing of, of technology and IP, and actually creating businesses inside the corporation. So we incubate businesses uh, inside GE. And if you visit us at 41 Farnsworth Street, uh, you'll see those businesses actually uh, resident within, uh, within GE. Uh, given the space to grow and operate like a startup, but uh, with uh, the clout of a, of a larger company, which is a pretty interesting model. And of course, on the investment side, uh, maybe we'll go to the next slide, to give you a sense of, uh, of what types of things uh, GE invests in. And, and this list is not uh, static, it, it changes, but this gives you a flavor. GE is obviously a very large, diversified company. Uh, we invest um, broadly in the footprint of the businesses that GE has but also ahead of those markets uh, with technology and market trends that maybe where GE is not present today. An example of that may be uh, in, the, in the mobility space, uh, in autonomous systems. Uh, GE is not a provider of, uh, of autonomous vehicles, but actually has an enormous amount of expertise and IP in, uh, in controls uh, and machine vision and things of that nature. So we're investing in in the forward markets for, for technology that is being used in, in, the, in the vehicle space. Um, manufacturing and supply chain pretty much covers uh, most of GE. Uh, it's, a, it's an industrial company that manufactures products, manufactures and services products. Many of those products are only made possible through innovations in manufacturing technology. Uh, and you're only able to operate globally if you have uh, a supply chain that is, uh, you know, that is the best in the world. And, uh, and, and, I, and I can tell you about Walmart's supply chain uh, and the complexities of that, but supply chains actually have received quite a lot of, uh, of um, attention from entrepreneurs and investors, and, and we've made several investments uh, in that as things are digitized and made more efficient and more transparent. Um, in addition to that, we have a sort of set of enterprise technologies, things that make GE go faster inside, so that's uh, how to run our business more effectively, more securely, more efficiently, uh, and those technologies can be around uh, as a, around security, around uh, Internet of Things uh, platforms to manage the Internet of Things, which is a, a, a big technology pillar for the for the organization, um, and as well as uh, actually as well as some other maybe less obvious things like uh, knowledge management and uh, and how to manage expertise in a very large organization, how to la leverage. The, uh, the thousands of, of uh, experienced and, and, and highly trained uh, R&D personnel that we have in the company most effectively. So it's a very broad investment area. Um, and we typically invest uh, at a similar stage to, to Eli's group in the sort of post, I would call it in the post product world. So there is something, uh, forget the labels of ABC because they're incredibly confusing and um, often uh, lead you down the wrong path. But if there's enough enough evidence that a company has a product and that product has uh, has interest from the marketplace, and that kind of draws us in towards investment and the corporation into engaging. So, if you go to the next slide. Uh, I think we'll just maybe a repeat. Keep going to the next one. So this is a, a, a bit of an eye chart, but it tells you about breadth. So the company's been investing for. Uh, for a long time in, in different guises, but in the current uh, formation of GE Ventures for at least six years, have a portfolio of in excess of 50 companies across many of these different themes. And so we're a set of, uh, we have a large portfolio and we, um, my day job is to engage much of this portfolio with, uh, with the business units of GE. So that's, that's an important one. You can go to the next one, I think that's it. Yep. All right, so that is GE Ventures. Happy to talk about uh, individual questions around that uh, in the Q&A, but let's hand it over to Colin and talk about VIA. Terrific. Well, thanks very much. Uh, particularly, thank you, Katarina and NECC for uh, inviting me here and, uh, you know, happy to have the opportunity to chat with uh, the illustrious colleagues, uh, Anna, Eli, and, and Daniel. Um, I think I'm here mainly, actually, to talk about my experiences as an entrepreneur, uh, 
briefly, I've spent 30, almost 30 years now in technology, started my career at IBM. I had two uh, startups, one in the 90s and one more recently that both sold quite successfully. In between, I was a, a partner and board director at a private equity firm with $2 billion under management. And, um, and in the last few years, um, I had the I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and had the opportunity to be the first investor or and board member at five MIT and Harvard spinouts. Um, and since 2016, co-founded Via uh, with a group of colleagues here in the Boston area. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, the quick overview of Via is that you know, we are in the area of providing analytics or artificial intelligence and analytics to power companies, particularly transmission and distribution companies. We do that globally. That's regulators in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and of course, North America. We have two offices, one here in, in the Boston area. Those of you familiar with Boston know that Harvard and MIT are not actually in Somerville, but for everybody else, it's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and our technical office is actually in Montreal. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, I think, you know, the only other kind of uh, point I would raise is having been, I've been on the investment side, but also more recently, we did raise a $7 million seed round at VIA, closed a, a few weeks ago. And so that probably, so I have some recent experience about fundraising and working with strategics as, uh, as Daniel had pointed out. So that's kind of the, the brief summary for, for me. Tremendous. All right. Well, that's uh, given, given everyone a, an overview of the, of the groups that are at the table here. So maybe we can start out with um, a question. I'm going to keep the panelists on their toes here because there's maybe some questions that they weren't expecting. But I'd like to go to Anna first and have others chip in. Um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot by entrepreneurs is whether it's best to have, in my case, GE or a corporation as a customer first or as an investor first. So does, uh, does, does revenue beget capital, investment capital, or does investment capital beget revenue? I think it's an interesting question and different groups have different perspectives. I'd like to pick up on something that, that Anna said about uh, about having uh, startups as customers. Maybe you could talk a little bit about a little bit about how you think about uh, investment versus versus uh, versus revenue. Well, this is the world's first answer, but it depends. I mean, it's, um, I mean, everybody hates that answer, but I think so. And this is one of the things that I was sort of noting before about the different branches of Walmart that handle innovation. So for the branches that handle things that are five to seven years out, I mean, of course, there's, there's some companies that are going to need investment before, uh, beforehand, there's no way that they're going to be able to capture um, any kind of revenue. And if we're looking at a technology that's, for example, going to, um, if it's like technology that's going to reimagine the way that we uh, do things in our stores, but there's no way that we'd be able to deploy it for, you know, five to seven years, and we're well aware of that, we would absolutely be more inclined to give them. And again, as I mentioned, we don't actually do um, we don't do equity investments. We actually tend to just hand people, you know, it's like a million dollars a month and um, say, we want you to focus on this product. Um, so, you know, I think we're very aware of the times where um, us being a customer is one thing versus, you know, people need financial support in order to get to the point where we could be a customer. Um, and I think the relationship and once it's in a good place, you'll you'll understand, you know, it, you've probably seen a company like that where you know exactly where they are and you know that they need support in order to even have a deployable product. Um, so, um, yeah. is that a terrible so, answer? <laughs> no, no, no. I think that reflects the reality. Um, Colin, yeah, ahead. I I was just going to say, so I, I think, you know, Anna's right. It does depend, right? There's, you know, by company. Yeah, you know, the the first two companies I had actually we did not raise any external financing, so we were all revenue bit like customers drove uh, you know the the growth of the companies. They're not mutually you know as you know revenue and investment are not mutually exclusive. It turns out if you have revenue and you're you know you grow customers, people will come to you and want to invest in the company, right? That's a, the so that you know there if you say you know is there a preference. 
from an entrepreneur standpoint, I would I would advocate like if you can get customer revenue, <laughs> that's the best way to finance your business. It's a proof point about you know there's a market readiness. You'll own continue to own much more of the company. Um, sometimes I think particularly if in certain neighborhoods like Silicon Valley or in Boston or in Cambridge, you get the people compete for raising money or or you know have pride in that. It's like you know. There's no real that that badge of honor you can do without actually right. I I advocate for people going and getting customers first, but as Anna points out, it's like uh, not possible for everybody. So you know, hopefully there are other. I would encourage people to look at non-dilutive financing or other kinds of financing mechanisms that aren't always just you know. It's not only those two binary options. There may be other ways for for research intensive, but but that would be sort of a I am point. I would think I would ask sort of entrepreneurs to think about. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll add yeah. um, my perspective and then hand it to you, Eli. Uh, so at GE, at GE Ventures, we don't explicitly tie investment to revenue. Um, often revenue and engagement with the business unit is an incredibly positive signal of companies that have uh, something real and are something of interest to the corporation. But um, as, a, as a, an investment group, as someone looking to make deals, if we tie ourselves to companies that are working with GE and had a certain amount of revenue, then it would it probably would pre-select uh, the universe of investments in a slightly odd way. There are groups out there that do require it. They do require um, considerable collaboration or product revenue flowing uh, before investment. And um, while that does mean that there is definitely a link between the portfolio, the soon-to-be portfolio company, and uh, the corporate investor. I, I think I haven't heard uh, particularly good things from entrepreneurs about about that process. Uh, it can be can be very drawn out. Um, Eli, any thoughts on this one? Yeah. When you look at yeah, your company, say, do you would, look at? Uh, go ahead. I, I, no, I would I would I would add two points about the, the corporate investment perspective. I think it's I think sometimes it's easier to approach corporates as a customer first, uh, just because the the investment side, um, you know, that, that can be difficult to tap into sometimes. And I think the other the other issue that you've seen sort of broadly with with corporate investment to keep an eye out on is is the relationship between uh, a company's IP and what happens when it takes investment from from a large strategic uh, in that case and you know what, what amount of I, I, IP do they have to hand over? Um, so you know those are just two two points to to keep in mind uh, from Greenbacker's perspective. I mean we don't you know, we're we're open we don't uh, have have specific requirements, um, but but yeah you know it's always nice to see the the, the revenue there. Yeah, absolutely. So on the on the ex expanding on the IP point, um, do you feel that uh, entrepreneurs have major concerns when approaching uh, corporations about about the treatment of their IP? And I'm not meaning to be sort of make light of that comment, but um, it's obviously a very large issue if you think you have a, uh, a you know a sustainable competitive advantage in your company through IP, and you you may be very averse to talking to a large corporation if you think they're going to steal your IP. Do you think that's, that's real or is it a, it's slightly overplayed? Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. I mean, it depends, depends what it is. I mean, I think, I think some companies naturally, their customers are you know, large, large corporates. And so, it, you know, if you think that someone can come in and just, you know, easily reproduce what you, what you can do because the, the corporate has more money, I think that's a, that, that, that's a concern. I think, I think the other concern is, you know, okay, if I make a relationship with one strategic, how does that, does that limit me in the market? Uh, does it limit, you know, who else you could, you could sell to, or, you know, does, does it limit, you know, what your, what your exit options are later on? If you take money from, from a particular company and they say, Hey, well, we want to write a first refusal as it relates to uh, IP or different types of transactions that you do. And so I think those are just things to, to be aware of. Yeah, I, I might say on the IP side that um, I think I hear this a lot, you know, particularly if you're in the MIT, Harvard circles, right? Everybody's got some crazy, you know, fabulous IP that they're developing and the founders or creators of those IP, of that IP are always feeling very personally attached to it, uh, which is good. But I, you know, I always say two things to them. One is the IP is only as good as like, you know, the, the team of the people who actually translate it into some solution for the market. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, like, don't worry, you know, it's important, but it's like not the only thing, you know, it's, it's really the problem you're solving. And the other is, it is true that, you know, 
I mean, you, we saw Anna, you know, said it's almost half, over half a trillion dollars in revenue for Walmart, right? So clearly there's money to be, they, Walmart could outspend, right, any startup on any individual item. Uh, and that's true for lots of big companies. But frankly, almost every big company has way better things to do with their time than try and steal and cheat, you know, small entrepreneurs. It's frankly much more of a headache for any big company to, you know, for their reputation to try and, you know, take anything from a, from small companies. So I, I think sometimes entrepreneurs are just too too closed about you know about revealing things because they're worried about this issue kind of unnecessarily. They 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 should be they you know so that I that might be just sort of yeah no I, I instinctively agree with that and I think that in the list of things to worry about as an entrepreneur your you know, ability to go quickly ability to you know scale your company and and the risks of not being able to do that by being bogged down in a corporate yeah. partnership outweigh the risks of, uh, of of something happening on the IP side. I've been in the venture world for almost 15 years. This has not been a top line issue with, with any of the companies that I've ever been involved with. It, it's it's often, uh, I think, a little, a little overblown in the mind of, the, of yeah. the entrepreneur. People often, I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they're always asking, you know, especially first time or, or they're, they ask the VCs or strategic, you know, to sign NDAs very early on. You know, that can be helpful, but I also think, uh, often it's they ask too early in that process, and um, you know I always say like, what exactly is somebody going to do with your business plan? Do you think GE or Walmart or Green is going to tweet it or put it on Facebook? Like they're not going to do any. You know, for the most part, you know the the information you're passing along is actually not that confidential or reusable, and um, you know so don't don't overemphasize that piece. And if there is something that's really really important, that's critical, then don't talk about it. Like it doesn't matter how good you. Your NDA is actually like leave it off the table. If there's something you really want to keep secret, don't mention it at all. That's you know because the NDA doesn't protect you. It's only something you can use afterwards. So, so maybe I switch gear and raise a, another topic. And, and uh, Catherine, you should keep an eye on the questions that are coming in over the, over the uh, on the on the webinar. So please feel free to, to air your questions in your in your comments. Um, a, a lot of my job, if I look back, or so where I spend my time is as a um, making introductions between uh, startup companies and uh, members uh, of, of individual business units, so technology leaders, business leaders within the company. Um, and often that leads to the development of what I call kind of an internal champion for a startup, which I think is a very important role. So um, maybe you could go first, Colin, to talk about um, how the success you've had in, in finding those people, maybe some of the pitfalls if they accidentally if they move uh, or, or if they're not necessarily in line with uh, the larger um, strategy or goals of the organization but talk about internal champions yeah so I think it's a uh, I think it's a, it's a vocabulary we use a lot at VIA about making sure we have uh, champions or people who are uh, who want to work with us so you know, we we talk about GE or Walmart, but you know, these are companies with hundreds of thousands, if not actually millions, of employees. So it is not uniform. You know, it's like saying, you know, the city of Boston, right? Like there are a lot of people here. So you know, we're all not created. You know, they're not molds. They're not actually all created equal. Uh, so within a company, um, you you know, there's a certain amount of navigation to find who's the individual who is. Um, especially at the early stage, it's super enthusiastic and interested in what you're trying to do. Um, partly, you know, the, you're, you know, what you're trying to do is actually lay out the the problem that's clear about the problem you're trying to solve, and they feel like you're going to help them actually solve the problem. Because the the early commitment that you need from people is their time. So the yeah, the, in every company, there is always something else you could be doing. They have 10 other projects. They have emails. They have their personal lives, right, to deal with. So, like, whatever they have on their agenda is super high, is super critical. And so for you to actually, you know, be successful, you need somebody who can, who wants to spend time with you. So that champion has to be somebody who is, who, who uh, you know, who, who is interested in what you're doing and willing to spend that time. And then the second is they have to be sort of savvy enough in the organization that they understand how the organization works to be able to help shepherd you through whatever process exists. So every company, GE and Walmart may have different processes for how they look at investments or how they scout new technologies, but they have a process. 
And what you want is somebody who's going to be able to help you understand what that process is and actually you know, navigate that and get the right people in the room. I look at convening power. So they can, when they call a meeting, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be the most senior person, but they can get two, three, five people in a room and set the meeting up in advance so that you're successful when you show up to that meeting. They give you coaching in advance about what to say, the politics, and how to, how to be successful in the follow-up. So lots of aspects about what, what makes a good champion there. Yeah. And I maybe uh, just insightful. get your perspective. Yeah. Are you, are you, yeah. Do you play that role or do you, do you show up for others at, uh, at Walmart? Um, so I would say normally it's the folks within the business unit. So everything he said is incredibly true, but you also have to have, and this is, they can be the same person, but it can also be that your champion just has a really good relationship with somebody who has signing authority, somebody who can say yes, because within a big company and you probably run against this, you can have 10 people that can say no and only one person that can say yes. Um, and there's this sort of running joke about nobody gets fired for buying IBM. And it's that there's the guy, your champion, he's also taking a risk by using, um, by going sort of a different route, by trying something innovative. And so that's also just something to be aware of, um, the de-risking. You just also have to do everything in your power to sort of de-risk whatever it is that you're experimenting on or just showing him how you've de-risked him or her. Um, how you've de-risked it, um, but you're right. Having a having a, a champion within the business is, I would say, probably among the most important, if not the most important, at a certain um, when you get to a certain spot thing that you know that determines whether or not your company really gets anywhere. So, um, and so, yeah. no, I would say it's probably finding that champion is more my my role than being it because it's like we'll find a different champion for each different company and just normally it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship so. yeah the one thing i would i would add and i maybe set the question up a little bit this way but uh as a as a unsolicited advice worth what you paid for it advice to entrepreneurs is avoid spot risk or individual risk with a champion because um, just like startups, large corporations change too. They change very frequently. People move around. Businesses get reorganized on a regular basis. It's sort of life in the big city. There's nothing uh, unusual about that. But if you find that you've dedicated a huge amount of time and energy to developing an individual relationship with, a, with an executive and that person moves and they're often reassigned to a completely different business unit, um, that's the way companies work, then uh, you, you didn't actually create the value you thought you were going to. One example I'll give uh, of, of, a, of a good example of this, where um, one of our portfolio companies, I, I can't name the name, but um, managed to sort of seed the idea of their company into the heads of almost every senior executive within, uh, within that branch of the business. So uh, as, as executives walked around, they knew about the company, they knew what it did, even if it was a, a subscale company, uh, but it had mind share. It was a sort of a known name. And that, and, and G actually didn't end up acquiring the company, but when the company was acquired, there was FOMO in yeah. GE, right? Um, uh, and that's kind of what you want. It was just Mo, you missed out. So no, there wasn't any. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think that had, from an entrepreneur's perspective, like well played uh, uh, on their part, and it, it required tenacity and sort of uh, and real thought about how to network into the company and how to plant those seeds of those ideas. But I, I say uh, I, I applaud that. I I think the at one of the tying those things together, I think you know Anna talked about risk, and the the truth is, for every technology, the by definition, if it's innovative or new, no one's done it before, or it's not been done a lot. So the people, the champion or the team, they are taking a they're taking a chance, and they need to trust the person. You cannot. There is no PowerPoint that you'll be able to show or patent that you'll be able to say, "Look, this is going to work." Right? If somebody's banking their career or they're shepherding you through, they have to look at you and say, "Yeah, I trust that whatever happens, it's going to work. You're going to make this work, and you're going to make this work out for for us." And they that so the people in that aspect is is kind of critical from that perspective, and often overlooked. But I think that, you know, we expect, look at my specs, the spec sheet, like, you know, look at my product. It's like, ah, oh, that's not it. Not for something new. That's not enough. 
So um, we've got this very robust discussion. We're given it uh, it's quarter to the hour. I'd love to get to some questions that have been coming in, and, and we have a handful here, but feel free to add more. Um, maybe one to Anna, if I just open this question up, uh, about machine learning at Walmart. I think you've, you've had some, you've, met, you've made some investments or engaged in companies where there's bringing machine learning to the retail environment. Perhaps you could talk about that. Certainly. Um, so I'm not sure if they want specific answers, but um, there are, you know, many, many ways where data science and so let me take a step back. Walmart has an incredible amount of data. Um, one of the things that we have probably as our largest um, emerging tech asset is data. It's data about um, things in the logistics space. It's data about people. It's data about purchases. Um, it's even data about store operations, store operations, which um, in in this probably audience is very important because so things like IoT um, store how to you know how to better operate our stores because so we're the um, second largest energy consumer in the U.S. Um, so how do we run our stores more efficiently? Um, information that data uh, is of course the the substrate the food for machine learning algorithms and um, so companies, different companies, we can't use all of it, and we certainly can't clean all of it. So um, we have found companies with selective expertise um, that have expertise in different areas, and we have partnered with them um, to work on those problem sets. So we'll find somebody who knows about, um, you know, logistics. We'll find somebody that knows about, um, you know, store um, store ops. And then we'll um, we'll work with them, often in a very controlled environment, um, with that data, and um, and yeah, and see what we can do. So, got it. Excellent. Um, so one here for uh, Eli with regard to Greenbacker Labs about maturity of a company. Uh, how far along should a new technology be before it be considered attractive for project finance? Uh, from someone like Greenbacker Labs about maturity and bankability, if you could speak. To yeah, that. I think. I think yeah. No, sure. Um, I think. I think when the when the technology is at sort of full, at least full pilot scale, um, and you've got you know maybe one or two units deployed, um, I think that's kind of the the minimum. And then to the extent that you know maybe there's been some some testing, some collaboration with uh, you know maybe with a university or, or some type of, of NGO that. Uh, can do some third-party verification. I mean, they, they, that's what we're. That's that's a part of the answer is it, it depends, but that's generally what we're what we're looking for. And you know, we would even go uh, potentially a, a little bit earlier. Um, you know, we just need to have good confidence that the that the technology works. Got it. And a couple of follow-ups there. While while we've got you there in the hot seat, so. Um, do you uh, do you engage with companies that are active in the in the developing world in developing countries, uh, or are you uh, are you U.S. centric? What's your geographic scope? Yeah, unfortunately, we're just we're just uh, North American centric for the moment. Um, so I wish we could do more stuff around the world. There's definitely great opportunities, but for the moment, we're just uh, North America. Okay, and last question: uh, best way to engage with the Greenbacker Labs? How do how do people find you, and and what's the best what's the best first step people can take? Yeah, best first step, uh, you know, reach out to us, send us a deck. Um, you know, we, we're, we're happy to, to chat with companies and, um, you know, see what you have. So you can send us a, an email at, at contact at, at greenbackerlabs.com or, or reach out to me directly. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question uh, will go to everybody. We'll, we'll start with Colin. Uh, I'm surprised we haven't mentioned it before. So great question about how prevalent not invented here syndrome is within organizations so uh, we've all come across it uh, where where the, the the internal folks think they've got everything covered and there's nothing new to be discovered from talking or working with a with a startup so um, how much have you seen that how prevalent is it and what do you do about it uh, so, wait, so you asked three questions related yeah. to that. <laughs> but, uh, first, you know, I think it's a, a, we referenced this earlier, any company like the size of GE or Walmart, these are big companies. So 
out of the 100,000, 300,000, 1 million, 2 million people who work at these companies, are there some that are, have a not invented here and will be totally closed-minded? Yes. Are there also some who will only look and really interested in external things and you know, more open? Absolutely. And then it's a matter of degrees, right? So you got to find the person who's more open and you know, that's part of the champion piece, which is finding the right piece. There are, of course, more cultures that are open uh, to this than others. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I always say, so if you're, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, the goal isn't to try and sell to every single company, right? Or to sell to uh, every person or convince everybody you meet that they are the, that your product or service is best for them. You're much better off at the early stage when you're going after your first one to 100 customers to just find the people who are like ready to go. So rather than you know try and overcome it i think the best thing to do is try and qualify people early on about what's their what are their attitudes and then you can kind of either say great i want to continue the conversation or if you run into the attitude then just move on really quickly so there are lots of qualifying questions you can ask you i wouldn't ask them you know what's your not invented here syndrome but you can ask oh how how many startups have you worked with in the last year Oh, can you tell me about like, oh, what's your pilot process, right, to work with new customer or new new technologies? Or, you know, there are lots of kinds of ways that you can you can ask. And if the answer is, oh, we haven't done that in a while, or we don't do that, or then you know, right, whether it's the attitude or not, it's like, ah, it's probably not a good use of your time to spend with them. And if they they have fifty examples right off the top of their head, it's like that's probably somebody you want to spend more time with. Yeah. All right. Any perspectives from? From Walmart, or even going back further into your past in uh, at, at Shell. So it's funny because at Walmart, our thing is more: do we want to invent it here? Like, do we want this to be a core capability that we build in house, or like I said, do we want to bring somebody in house, or do we want to have it be? Um, so at Shell, we were doing vertical disk integration, so we were having more and more. Um, people who we kept as vendors and we wanted that vendor relationship. We didn't want to do things in-house because we found it was more expensive. At Walmart, we're having sort of the opposite thing where we're trying to do more and more things in-house. Um, so even if we know it's not a capability, we're, we're thinking maybe we should try and build it as one. So that's interesting. Um, and so it's not so much that we're seeing a whole lot of not invented here syndrome, but it's like, should we build this as a department syndrome? Um, it's, um, so yeah. I, I don't know. I think Walmart is aware of the fact that as a company, it's behind in certain spaces. Um, and it's just trying to figure out where it wants to play and how it wants to get there. You know, does it want to hire a bunch of people? Does it want to acquire different companies that do this? Um, or, or is it happy having a relationship where it is just a customer to certain, um, to certain spaces? So, so yeah. Okay. And I, I, yeah. I, I just want to, I just want to, yeah, I was just going to add, add one more thing, thing, thing to that. So to what types of companies to look for, I would say, you know, in addition to the large corporates, I think also looking at kind of, uh, mid-sized regional companies, uh, family owned companies can also be good corporate relationships because oftentimes you'll find that. You know, they they recognize that they need some type of innovation, and so uh, they're receptive to to working with entrepreneurs, and that's another way to to create a uh, a good corporate strategic relationship. Yeah, and the only other thing I I might add to that I think is that what what Anna and, and Eli are saying are true at the corporate level, right? So what's the, at the strategic level and a corporate level? What is the institution kind of trying to accomplish? Um, but in the end, you're you know the you know, the startup is going to meet a person. And that person may be threatened, maybe kind of like that's their job is to look for innovation or their person may also be threatened, right? So depending on how you frame your solution or product, if you have an automation product, uh, very often, you know, the goal you're, you're saying, hey, look, look at the cost savings, look at the automation I'm going to have. And then, you know, who gets to evaluate that? You know, somebody who may say, wait, that's my job, right? I'm going to look at to see whether the solution is good or bad and whether it can actually automate. It's like, well, wait, what happens to my job if I, you know, if I actually accept this? You run into, it's not just not invented here. It's like, wait, you know, obsolescence may happen and, and that's a threat. So being able to make sure as you have, you know, the people you're meeting, you are framing your solution and product if you, if you, you know, as this is going to be super beneficial to you no matter who you are in the organization um, so that you don't run into that, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to eliminate your job, right? Yeah. That's, that's never going to go well. I think that keys into, we didn't talk about this, but one of the, one of the 
items I've got here around the difference between sort of incremental versus disruptive innovation when it when it uh, interfaces with a corporation. I think you probably get more receptive audiences if you if you're providing a technology that will immediately boost sales, immediately in, enhance a product lineup, immediately expand uh, uh, an audience or, or shorten the sales cycle or catch up with competition, kind of like now, because everybody's got their numbers to hit. If you're pitching something that's going to turn the apple cart upside down, uh, you run, you can run into not just not invented here, but I don't want this here because this is threatening you know, what I've got in, inside my corporation. So that's very real. Um, I'm going to bounce around and maybe take a couple more, and then we then we we close to the wrap up time. So, a couple of questions have come in around uh, geothermal. Uh, I'll speak to GE Ventures. Um, we do not have a lot of exposure in in geothermal, and I think that really is uh, a webinar of its own um, about <laughs> the challenges of geothermal around um, some about technology, but other about sort of market construction and market development. Um, at very large scale and bankability and financing and things of that nature. It's an incredibly important topic, but um, hasn't been the most obvious fit with, with venture capital uh, over the years. There are a couple of a couple of high risk, high reward projects out there that have received some attention, but not been a very big um, not been a very big category. I think that covers most of them, apart from one question, which was what is our budget, which is something that I, is probably career limiting for me to say. <laughs> so I will, I will not take that one. But uh, I think that's some fantastic questions. Um, maybe as we kind of transition to the wrap up, I have um, a question to all of our participants, all of our panelists here. It's like, what is the one piece of advice you would give, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the one piece of advice you would give to uh, entrepreneurs or other entrepreneurs uh, as they think about engaging with a corporation, if you put yourself in the shoes of, a, of an entrepreneur working walking into that that meeting, what piece of advice would you give? Maybe we'll start with you, Eli. Yeah, I mean, I think you just look at it from the from the corporation's perspective. How, how can you help them? Right, it's a sales pitch at the end of the day. Whether you're selling them as a as a customer or as a as a, you know you want them to be an investor, it's how, how does how does what you have help them and and you know, being as clear and, and succinct as, as possible. Great advice. Anna. Um, yeah, that's no, that is great advice. And I guess piggybacking on top of that, I would say um doing your homework. So coming and this will save you time too, um, just coming prepared um and making sure that you know who the right people to talk to are because a lot of big corporations are pretty different and they're looking for different things and doing your homework can mean talking to people or it can even be as simple as like Google searches and just checking out web pages. Um, you know, a lot of us have pretty detailed um, web pages. So, um, so yeah, that can be pretty useful. Right. Great advice. Um, um, I go back maybe to the people theme. I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs focus a lot, you know, on their PowerPoint or their deck, which is important for the first 30 seconds, right? right. But uh, deals are done and customers are won by the relationships you build with people. And don't forget that the person at the other end is not just a, a computer that has a tick list of, do you meet the spec list or do you meet this criteria? They want to you're going to have to work with them and people work with people they like and respect. So you want to, you want to be, work, you know, think about those aspects, not just the product or your PowerPoint. Tremendous. I think that, 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 that uh, so far, all of these three are just general great advice specifically with, uh, with corporations, but also in, in a general context, I would add, um, you want to make a, uh, the first impression is incredibly important. You obviously want to make a, a very strong first impression, but realize that things are very, very rarely resolved in one meeting. Yeah. This is the beginning of a relationship that may take months or years to develop. And so you should think about the interaction in that way, that where are we going to go from here? What is going to happen next? Who is going to be responsible for the next piece of action? And do we all know what it is? So there are too many occasions where it's uh, what I call kind of empty calories. So everyone feels good. They've all learned something. The entrepreneur has got access to a corporation, but nothing happens there is no follow-up and the key is in the follow-up so set the goals make sure people are accountable for hitting them think about this as the beginning of a long-term relationship 
and that's going to require tenacity. That would be the advice I would, I would give to an entrepreneur. So it's, it's one o'clock already. I've probably crashed the crashed the clock. But over to you, Katrina. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, wrap it up. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Daniel and uh, uh, Anna, Eli, and Colin for this lively and informative webinar. Thank you as well for you to, for joining us today. We hope this was a valuable session for everyone and again to our invaluable partners. Today you will receive the short survey that I mentioned in the beginning and uh, very soon we'll share the recording of the webinar along with the slides as well. We hope to see you all in our next and final webinar of 2019, later mid-December. And uh, we wish you a great day, everyone. And please help us spread the word about the Navigate webinar series and the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.